We're now joined by producer David Prater. How are you today? Doing great. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I know you're busy at B and and looking to uh, create a, a awesome new setup for you and your your music. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, how you got involved in music, how the journey began. Well, I was. Uh, I, it all began in Texas. I was born in Fort Worth, and uh, my family moved uh, further south, uh, outside of Austin, a town called Temple. And I started playing drums first, uh, and then I got more and more involved with that. Um, I, I started, you know, it really kind of developed for me when I got in, into uh, Frank Zappa and when I saw them at the Armadillo World Headquarters and that's when the drumming thing really became you know an obsession and uh, when I uh, left high school I wasn't ready to go to Los Angeles or New York so I had a friend that lived in Mill Valley and I went out to California after I played around Texas for a couple of years and uh and back then, you could play five, six nights a week, four to five sets a night. So you got really good, really quick. And you could support yourself. So anyway, uh, I was in San Francisco playing in various, you know, cover bands. And I got the audition for Santana. And that's when everything really took a hypersonic trajectory. Now, what, what year was that? And what album was Santana working on? The year was 1976 in August during the Montreal Olympics, and uh, Santana had just finished Amigos, um, and he had let the entire band go. At that time, it was a drummer named Ndugu. Um, Tom Coster, he retained, but uh, Greg Walker was the singer, I believe. Um, there was Bobby Vega, I think, had been the bass player, and everybody, there was, there was, he was just ready to make a change, and so uh, he held. A, I, I found out I was rehearsing for a session across the street from SIR Studios in San Francisco, and at that time, Jay, the CBS had an office. I mean, directly across the front door of SIR. So I had been recording at CBS and rehearsing at SIR, and I heard about an open audition for Santana. And I managed to snake my way in. I was the first one in. And when I came in, uh, my life changed forever. <laughs> wow. And that was going to be the band that uh, was going to, we were going on a world tour after a fall tour of what they call the uh they call them sheds, so the amphitheaters like Hoffman Estates and right. uh, Pine Knob, I think, in Michigan or Minnesota, something like that. You know, those amphitheater dates, yeah, they're all over the place in the East. That Rider State Art Center is kind of like Yeah, it's your, it's your summer outdoor amphitheaters. You got it. Now, obviously, Carlos Santana is still regarded as one of the innovators, one of the most passionate guitarists in history, you know, played at Woodstock, here we are 50 years later, you know, he's still, he's still packing him in. What did you learn most about working with Carlos, and what, what did you, what can you enlighten us kind of behind the scenes on what kind of person he is that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know just as a listener? Oh, goodness. Uh, I'll try and keep it short. Um, learning from Carlos if nothing else, the first day that I came in to the audition was an out-of-body experience. And it was just so strange. I had, I, I had barely been out of high school for a year and a half. And in walks Bill Graham, the uh, music promoter, concert promoter, that had Fillmore East and Fillmore West. And here he is, walks in the room, and comes and sits right next to me for the uh, duration of it. And we start playing. And at that point, everything that you would come to believe about Carlos from watching videos and listen to, you know, listening to the records, man, it was just all manifest right there in front of you. And after we played, God, we, we must have played like 30, 45 minutes straight. Then we started to work 
working on some stuff that, you know, I wasn't familiar with more traditional Latin rhythms. And at one point, um, I started playing, and he kind of looked at me and said, here, let me show you. Give me the sticks. And she grabs the sticks, and I said, yeah, she, you know, go ahead. It was called the Wawang Ko. And he actually played me kind of a basic idea of what it was, and that was my first introduction into how to play Latin correctly. And I, right there on the spot, I, I picked it up, and we kept playing. So it really started, you know, when you play with Carlos, one thing you must understand, Carlos plays all the instruments. So he's liable to be playing congos, timbales, bongos, bass. Uh, when, uh, as uh, After I got the nod the next day that I'd gotten the gig and rehearsals began, we used to ride together. I would pick him up. I lived in, uh, I think it was San Rafael. And I would uh, pick him up in Mill Valley, and we would go uh, to SIR. And one night after rehearsal, we went to his house, and he was just building a recording studio. And it was Tom Cruciere, uh, who was the brother of Juan Cruciere from Rat. He was the singer. But uh, that night, he played bass. Carlos played drums, and I was a good guitar player. And here I am playing guitar. You know, Carlos is playing drums, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, man, I didn't drop acid. How is this happening? So, you know, initially it was uh, just an unbelievably out-of-body experience. It was spiritual. It was, you know, you just felt so privileged. And then something else happened. <laughs> Are you there? Yes, I am. Well, yeah, no, we, uh, we can't get enough of Carlos' David, stories, you know. David Rubinson came in from Columbia Records and decided that Well Amigos had gone gold. That was his first successful record in the last three that he had released because he kind of went into this spiritual thing with John McLaughlin. Yeah. So there had been Caravanserie, Love, Devotion, Surrender, Barbaletta, and they weren't. You know, he was losing his audience. And then David Rubinson came in, who was the uh, head of AMR and one of the executives at Columbia, CBS. And he uh, he basically read him the riot act and said, nope, it's the band. You're going to go and make a record. You can always tour. We, we need to follow up Amigos. And it wasn't probably a month we had been in recording. I'm not recording, but, you know, rehearsing. And rehearsing new material and the uh, the repertoire he played in concert, and then you know before you knew it, it was kind of you were back out in the street fending for yourself. So it was it was heartbreaking. Oh, I know that's you know some life lessons you learn there, and you know we've certainly enjoyed the uh, the music that you made. And I understand you played with the great Brian Setzer from the Stray Cats, who still to this day does his big Christmas show and the, the rockabilly thing and I know the Stray Cats are doing a little 40th anniversary or some kind of reunion tour as we speak. Tell us about really? tell us about working with Brian. Wow. Working with Brian Setzer was the most challenging gig that I've ever you know taken part in because of the fact that the the musicians are so good. And the level of scrutiny was so high. Uh, you had Chuck Lavelle on keyboards. You had Kenny Aronson from, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's it guys like Billy Squire and oh, all sorts of uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, stories with the mini bands going back into the late 60s, early 70s. So he was playing bass, and he'd been with Derringer for And then a guitar player that was... Uh, well known in Long Island that has been uh, with Billy Joel for probably the better part of 20 years, Tommy Burns, and then yours truly. And um, and I was brought on board because I could play and sing. And so, you know, it was, uh, it won uh, let me just put it this way, Jay, one day at rehearsal at SIR before we went on tour, Brian didn't like the way something sounded, and he said, I want you to play and sing your part by yourself. So I had to play a portion of the song 
song, you know, boom, chuck, boom, boom, and seeing what my part was. While it was in the PA, the record company was out there, you know, everybody was in the room. And so you really felt very, very exposed, you know, but uh, he demanded excellence, and he was going to get it one way or the other. Wow. It was demanding. Yeah, well, I know he... uh... As well, very rewarding. I know he's keeping that rockabilly thing alive and loves all that early rock and roll, the Little Richard and Eddie Cochran and Jerry Lee Lewis and and all, all that, yep. you know. So some people out there saying rock and roll is dead, but, you know, with people like Carlos and Brian around, I don't think it stands a chance of doing that. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, now, tell us about transitioning into engineering and producing and, and, and what you feel you're capable of bringing you know, to these projects like Dream Theater and, of course, you know, all, all the great stuff, Night Ranger and Firehouse, everything that you've been doing. Well, what I felt from the beginning that I could bring creatively started almost as soon as I started playing, you know, because all the records that you're listening to, Yes, and Genesis, and Frank Zappa, and... You know, Todd Rundgren's Utopia and all these incredible, you know, artists that were around at the time. I, you know, the, what I really cut my teeth on was Chick Corea, Return to Forever, and Ma Vision of Orchestra. So I was very involved with fusion. And that is what informed my ability to look at a band like Dream Theater and, and understand exactly what their music was about, all the different complex time signatures. And most people are unaware of that. But I, at one time, had been asked to uh, replace Phil Collins for a tour in a band of his called Brand X, was was an offshoot of Genesis. And I had been on tour with Nona Hendrix from LaBelle, uh, opening for Peter Gabriel on his first European tour in, in 1976, not long after uh, my time with Santana. So from my background playing very challenging music, you know, when I got the call to do Dream Theater, it was just like somebody put a filet mignon in front of me, and I was famished, man. I just devoured. I just could not wait to do it. And I understood the arrangements, all of the, you know, all of the chord structure and the melodies. And, you know, for me, it was a match made in heaven. Um, I can't speak for everybody else, but, you know, it was, it was, I would have to say without question, it was a high point of my career, the, uh, doing the images and words with Dream Theater. Yeah. Well, I know you've continued to develop, you know, a, a, as a producer and, you know, what are what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in the in the tech world? You know, how people are making records and, you know, how it's benefiting, you know, more of the, the independent artists coming up that don't have the big budgets. Well, you know, like just about any technological advancement in our in our society and in our culture, I mean, there's blessings and curses. And uh, just look at the automobile. And so, as far as the logical challenges, the fact that just about any Tom, Dick, and Harry can, you know, go to or, or just go online and download a, a multi-track recording program almost gives license to a lot of charlatans, you know, uh, you know, kind of posers to, you know, spend time with it and get a, a bunch of guys together that maybe know the equipment better than he does in the technology, and all of a sudden he becomes a producer. That is a downside. But on the upside is the tremendous flexibility with digital recording, especially now with the Pro Tools and Logic and Cubase and all the various platforms, is the editing, if nothing else. Uh, being able to just do remarkable stuff with MIDI, editing and uh, all of the you know the, the all of the plugins and special effects that are your fingertip that was impossible when i did dream theater it was basically doing it the same way it had been done since 1950 you know you you set yourself up for the recording 
you get the best performances that you can, you keep meticulous notes, and you just keep going until it sounds like what everybody says, that's it. But with uh, digital, it's oh, if you make a mistake, you just hit un. <laughs> you know, you can't do that with tape. I mean, if you make a mistake and you record over it and say, oh, I like the other one, well, it's gone. You erased it. So, you know, technologically, um, I'm finding at this point that with auto tune and a lot of the vocal processing that's taking place, that it's, it's really, at some point, it's, it's, I, I don't know if you feel this way, Jay, but it's taken some of the humanity out of the music, and it almost sounds like it's uh, entirely computer-driven at times. But that also depends on the genre, too. Not all music is doing that. So you have to remember, you know, um, you know what genre and what style of, of music it is that you're talking about. Because it's exciting, there's no question about it. I mean, I support it, but it's it's still, I think, uh, Jay, I think it's, it, it, at this point, the technological revolution is like water. It's trying to find its level, and it will. Well, there's, there's no question. I mean, when, when you look at some of the greatest records made in the 60s and the 70s and, you know, the Beatles on, on up, you know, how how primitive the recording gear was, how, how few tracks they had, you know, the Muscle Shoals studios, all these great studios that cranked out classic records with very little technology. And, you know, I, I, I definitely feel a groundswell, especially for those of us that grew up, you know, with great 70s artists, that oh, yeah. too much music has gotten too clinical, too and too, you know, too precise. They took the emotion out of it. You know, when you listen to one of those classic Rolling Stones records or one of those great songs, it's it's almost the, you, you know, less than perfect, you know, timing that Keith Richards has that makes it so great, you know, and we're missing that. So I feel a groundswell of what I call new soulful music coming out. It's like real players, real songs, real singers. Oh, yeah, and it's happening. You're right. I mean, it's out there. But it's not on the tip of everyone's tongue yet, you know. Um, but you know something? I mean, I've like you. You've seen a lot of changes over your years and your career, as as have I. I was there in uh, London and saw the entire thing happening with punk, and I saw it ten years earlier with the British invasion. So you know, things will evolve whether you want them to or not. It won't remain this way forever. But I'm sure looking forward to when people wake up and say, you know, I think we need some more humanity back. You know, where's the, where's the next Marvin Gaye, you know? So. Well, that's it. I mean, I always say, if, if you can't sing it a cappella or play it acoustically, you know, what is it you, you really got? Yeah, that's right. I agree. Totally. So, well, that's fantastic. I, I know you've uh, experienced so much. You stay on the cutting edge of bring out the best in songs, arrangements, production, you know, all of that. What, what, what is some of the advice you can give to up-and-coming creators and, you know, engineers to, you know, instill a little of this, um, you know, classic feeling in, in their music? Well, the advice that I would give to people that are coming into it and trying to make leave their mark on the world, make it and then leave it, have something that they can look back 20, 30 years down the road, you've got to, you've got to work with people that are better at doing what they do than you are doing what you do. And that's the only way you're going to grow and improve, and that comes from whether you're an engineer or a ranger or a musician or a programmer, you know, and it's you know, nowadays it seems like you got to be all of them at the same time. And, you know, I'm not a, a big fan of uh, having that many, you know, titles that you have to have under your name. But realistically, the, you got to, you know, if you're an engineer, you want to, man, you want to get next to the best people that you can with respect to talent. You know, people that can sing their, their asses off you know, and play and just flat out deliver. 
And that's when you're going to learn about performances and the human element and how critically important it is to the heartbeat of humanity. And I, uh, Jay, do you remember Don Grierson? Did you know him very well? Yeah, Don was a, a great friend. I spoke on many of his classes, uh, and, and we truly miss him. Well, Don and I were very close because when he was the uh, executive of the A&R department at Epic, I did the two fire uh, records and uh, diving for pearls. And across the street in Atlantic, I was doing the Dream Theater. So we, we kept in constant contact, and he was critically important in giving me an opportunity to, to really start to work with the boys. And i got to tell you, Don's whole thing, when you say what advice is it, man, I mean, all he wanted to hear was let me, show me the songs, show me the material. And and that was it. He, you know, he didn't let you get bogged down in the minutia. And, you know, you hear that in the beginning, you know, the beginning it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, the song's great. Okay, uh, what's the, you know, what studio are we, are we working at? What's the budget? And he's like, the heck with all that. You know, I want to hear the material. So that got drunk into my head so heavily. And, uh, you know, I am forever grateful to him for that. And and I still, I'm, I'm telling you, if the performances and the, if it doesn't give you goosebumps and make your eyes water and give you that lump in your throat, what's the point? You know, and so you've got to try. 